and welcome to Channel Cheese. In New York, I met one of my cheese idols, Max McCalman, maitre fromager, author, and dean of curriculum at Artisanal Cheese. I asked Max how he became a maitre fromager. It's all been self-taught. Uh, I, I do uh, attend seminars, and uh, when I first began this career in uh, the mid-90s, I did uh, ask experts to, uh, to come in and give me uh, uh, some training and uh, I would also attend uh, any, any seminar, I read everything that I could find, traveled a lot, uh, became a member of the American, a member of the American Cheese Society uh, back then. And, um, and so uh, autodidact uh, was my main way of training, but I also realized that after doing this for a while that it was very helpful for me to have some of the courses that I had in my liberal arts education organic chemistry especially, which at the time I didn't know what I was going to do with, uh, with this, but uh, now I uh, apply it on a fairly regular basis to, to what I'm doing. Uh, it helps me understand cheese a little bit better is to get down to the molecular level a little bit. And, um, but also in cheese there's so many facets to cheese, as you know, there's a little bit of economics, there's politics, there's history, there's science, and uh, uh, from land to, uh, to safety and uh, so many different aesthetics uh, to cheese as well, that uh, uh, it seems to be an endless study. So to be a mental fromager, this is something that was, I was given this title uh, at Pichelin restaurant years ago by the chef owner. Uh, I was combining the job of being maître d'hôtel and fromager, so we just put the two together and I became maître fromager when I did not really know that much about cheese. It behooved me to become uh, as knowledgeable as possible, as quickly as possible. And I think that in the course of producing my books is probably, that's, that was a great training experience for me. Uh, the Cheese Plate and then the Connoisseur's Guide and then uh, the new book, Mastering Cheese. I, I learned a lot. And, uh, and a lot of it, uh, I'm still learning. It's, and it's happening so quickly. It's, it's hard to, it's a moving target, this, this cheese world. So uh, to be, I think the best way to learn about cheese is to eat it. And to eat as much of it as possible, which I do uh, on a daily basis. This is uh, cheese uh, from Vermont. Mm -hmm. It's called Laurier, the French name for a bay leaf, yes. Laurier. It is pasteurized, but it's still very nice. It's one thing that I'm happy to see and that for pasteurized cheese, where they must be made with pasteurized milk, that um, cheesemakers are learning uh, to work with uh, uh, different uh, cultures to, uh, to be able to put flavor back into cheeses that might, might be eliminated through heat treatment. At least the flavor is there, if not the aroma. There's a lot of support for buying cheese that are produced uh, within, within a, uh, a few square mile uh, radius. Uh, the farmers markets here in New York City uh, have cheese makers bringing in their cheese from uh, the surrounding region and uh, I think that's, that's the ideal. If you can buy directly from the producer, uh, if you do have access to a good uh, uh, farmer's market that has a good cheese selection, when you can see the cheese maker or someone that's working closely with the cheese maker, I think that gives you better assurance of the quality of the product. And you can also give feedback to the cheese maker, tell them what you think about their cheeses. And this is a uh, nettle metal cunic from New York. This is also pasteurized. This is uh, goat milk uh, with uh, Jersey cream added to it. It's quite an unusual so, pairing, isn't it, to actually just put the cream in then with the goat's milk. Yeah, so lovely too. Mm. Terra Luna is very nice. And mm. uh, that's, that's raw. And that's an American one? Yes. Uh -huh. Which state is that from? Utah. Yeah, this is always a question, what do you do about these large diameter cheeses? Yes. So, there we go. Through our website, artisanalcheese.com, I like to promote uh, cheeses and when I find new cheeses coming in or uh, I find a selection of cheeses that's just looking phenomenal that day, I like to get the word out. One thing that's great about having uh, an online retailer is if people don't have a farmer's market or if they don't have a good retailer in their, in their homes, then they can have cheese on their doorsteps the following day. This is the Estella Royale. This is raw sheep's milk from Northwest Spain. This is one that uh, we selected for our 16 program. I, it's, it's one of the best in, in its class. Uh, 
even within the industry, people are still looking at cheese as uh, it's a, as an indulgence. And I, I want to assure people that uh, they can eat as much as they want to. It's not going to be a problem. This is a raw milk Munster. <gasps> yeah. So because it's not from Alsace, it's from Austria, they have mm -hmm. to call it a different name. Okay. So they call it Edwin's Munster. Okay. But it's delicious. And you do a bit of washing of that here if it needs it? Yeah, we uh, give it a few more bounce. Mm -hmm. Just taste it by itself is, is one thing, but to compare one cheese to another, uh, to, uh, to also to be with other uh, palates that you trust to get their feedback, or to use uh, a beverage or other food as a platform for tasting cheese helps, helps me to uh, uh, pick up on nuances in cheeses that I might miss otherwise. It can bring out new flavors or aromas by uh, tasting cheeses alongside uh, wines especially, which was my background before, before cheese. Uh, that was my, uh, that was my uh, main area of study before I became a, a cheese guy. Appenzeller. Okay, this is a Beeler Appenzeller, so it's... Oh, okay, yes, I've seen a lot of, um, is it Rolf? Mm-hmm, called the Swiss Pope, Pope of, Pope of cheeses. Pope of cheese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All these cheeses are blessed. Yes, and blessed by Rolf. I think uh, one thing that is driving the cheese wave here in the United States is a recognition that it is a near-perfect food. And it does enjoy a stellar track record for food safety. Uh, it is uh, one of the one parts of the trend is that we are recognizing that uh, gradually that uh, unpasteurized cheeses are not only delicious uh, and flavorful and uh, with fuller aromas uh, with better textures, but we're also beginning to recognize that there is a little more nutritive value to be offered in raw milk cheeses. Um, it's not always possible, of course, for a cheesemaker to work with raw milk. Uh, but uh, we do have, uh, I, I, am, I think that we're fairly lucky to have uh, the regulations that we have where we can, uh, we can sell or we can produce cheese made with unpasteurized milk so long as they're aged 60 days at a cool temperature. Uh, I would like to change that and uh, reduce it down to 30 days. Uh, if I want to eat a raw milk cheese, uh, why not? It's my choice. This is Berkshire Blue, also raw. So is it made in a, a large cylinder, like a fond d'ambert or yes. a fond de mm -hmm. yeah. Oops. It's a little bit dry, but it's still very it's tasty. Lovely. Yeah, lovely flavor. Thank you. It's, it's quite a kick, hasn't it? Yeah. Mm. But it's not overwhelming. It's not too blue. It's very well balanced. And not too salty. Mm. It's a really nice texture actually, isn't it? It's still got the crumbliness going on, mm -hmm. but once it's in the mouth, it's still quite smooth. Kind of Stilton-esque, mm. a little bit. But raw. Mm. 